coming up, and uh, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. So keep that in your prayers. Uh, Miss Lil and Miss Jane and their helpers are going to be uh, going to be in business again. So we're looking forward to that. Okay. What's that? You guys can have you guys can have squid if you want. Have whatever you want. I know if you make it, it's going to be good. So that you can have anything, just a, anything except liver. No, no liver. Okay. That'll be fine. Whatever you guys, whatever you guys want, because whatever you make, it's going to be delicious, and we're looking forward to it. Well, you had some garlic on the side. Miss Lil, she'll sneak some in. Okay, she'll sneak some in. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, anyway, be praying for that. It's coming up. Okay. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, actually, we're going to back up just two verses into chapter 10. Because we've been, we've been going through this letter, and we're coming to a, a, a conclusion here in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> the apostle has uh, presented his, his doctrinal position in these first several chapters, how the old covenant was just a picture of the new, and now that, that Christ had been sacrificed and offered his blood, the blood of the new covenant, that the old was no longer Necessary. It doesn't mean that the Old Testament isn't necessary. We, we read and study from the Old Testament. The old is in the new, and the new is in the old. They're, they're tied in together, all God's word. But the commands or the, the demands of a, of a holy God have been satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. And the thing is, I've said this before, and, and the apostle is bringing it home now here in the latter part of Hebrews is that our salvation isn't based upon performance. It's not based upon uh, the law that we, or the, the, the requirements that we lived under. In the, if you know anything about, uh, if you've ever heard the word dispensation, we're not going to get into dispensation tonight, but there was a dispensation of innocence and a dispensation of conscience. And, and in, each, in each, each time, there were, God had a different requirement as evidence of a person's rela- relationship with him. But the bottom line is this, whether it was in the garden or before the flood or in Abraham's time or during the time of the law or the time of grace, salvation has always been by faith, by believing God. God said to Abraham, he says, God's, it was, the Bible says, Abram believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness before the law, before anything. So from Adam until now, the vehicle for our salvation is faith, believing what God says. One time says, somebody said to me, well, that didn't apply to Adam. What, what did he have to believe? Well, he had to believe the one commandment that was given him. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was, he only had one, one thing to believe. If you eat of this tree, you'll die. And obviously he disbelieved God. But our salvation is based on faith. Whether you lived in that period before the flood, whatever, whatever time it was, it was based on faith. And in, chap- in verse 38 of chapter 11, and I didn't put it up there, and that's okay, guys. We're just going to two verses, and then we'll get into chapter 11. You got it. Praise the Lord. They're good. All right. They, they can anticipate. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Now the just shall live by faith. Remember, Paul quoted this in Romans. He quoted it in Galatians. The three great doctrinal, when it comes to salvation, the three great doctrinal epistles, the just shall live by faith. Old Testament, New Testament, kingdom, age, that, that's, we live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That must mean that there were some that he was writing to that were contemplating drawing back. He says, but we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We have faith. If we're saved tonight, we're saved because of faith. 
We have grace. God gives us grace. We have faith. We believe what God says. And we see in chapter 11, and this is probably one of the, the, one of the most you know, quoted read chapters, especially in, the, in the, uh, the kind of charismatic circles where they got into the name and claim of thing, you know. They, they, took these, they took some of these passages and they, they kind of pumped them up bigger than what they should have been. But, or they misapplied them. So if, if you, you know, when I got saved, it was right in the middle of the charismatic renewal and stuff. And, and I was, you know, that's what I was exposed to. And thankfully, as I, you know, grew and, and learned more, I was able to filter out the good stuff from the bad. But this first verse is kind of like a, just like a foundational verse about what faith is. Because somebody says, well, what is faith? Well, some people say, well, they'll, they'll use the, the, the term the faith. And when it's used like that, it usually means like the church, the faith. We're in the faith. I belong to a Christian church. I have the faith. But that's not what this is. Faith is. Now, faith is. It was in Adam's day, and it is today. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we know that faith deals with stuff that we can't see. Stuff that hasn't happened yet. Things hope for, it's looking forward to something. But when, when you see this word hope used, it's not, we use that word with a question mark. You know, I hope something is going to happen. I hope this is going to take place. That, But we know by faith the reality of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the reality of my home in the presence of God for eternity because of what Christ did. That's not, that's, I can't see that. I can't imagine that. You know, looking around us in the world that we live in, it's, it's so hard to imagine a time and a place that we call heaven. But we know. If you don't know, then you need to examine your faith. I know. People say, you know you're going to go to heaven? I know I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Because you're good? No. Because I believe in what Jesus did. I have faith. I wasn't there at the cross. I didn't see it. But I, I believe what this says. So faith is the substance or the stuff you can feel, you can grab a hold of, of things hoped for. We can't see, we can't literally touch it, but it's as if it's right here in our hand. We believe. We believe what God says. Paul, you know, Abraham, and we're going to read here, they, he believed. We're going to see as, as we go through this chapter how the faith of some of the Old Testament patriarchs manifests itself in very tangible ways. Because faith is tangible. It says it's the substance of things hoped for. <clears throat> and it's the evidence or the proof of things not seen. What is the proof of heaven? It's what I read here. I, I've never touched it. I don't know what it looks like. I, don't, I, can't, I can't imagine that. But I'm convinced the very fact that I have this faith in my, in my heart is proof that it exists. You get that? If, because you have a hope of eternity, that's proof that there's some, something inside of you because if we look on it in the natural, <coughs> it's just, you know, it's just like a fairy tale. It's a story. It's something you read. But I know it's proof I can touch it. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Now he's going to begin here a list of manifestations of faith. If you have faith, it will manifest itself in tangible, experiential things. That's why I've said so many times, people that claim to be believers or claim to know Jesus, and there's, there's no... There's no evidence, there's nothing, there's nothing you can point to and say, well, look, I believe God and maybe a testimony, maybe a deliverance, maybe a change in their life. I believe God and this happened. I believe God and <coughs> I experienced this. 
I, I believe God and, and, he, and he showed me and, and he gave me the, the, the strength to be obedient in this area. Uh, I was delivered from, you know, every, everybody I know that is truly saved has a testimony of something. And, and, and not just one, but we want more. You know, I could talk about stuff that happened 25 years ago, but I want some testimonies like right now. You know, I, I mean, it doesn't stop. It's not like a one-shot deal. Faith keeps manifesting itself in our lives. Sometimes it's through hard times. Sometimes it's through good times. You know, God has a way. If you believe God, you will have a testimony. Sometimes they're little testimonies. Sometimes maybe just a testimony of sharing something with somebody. We were talking last night that, you know, just... Man, I was able to just share a little, drop a little seed. Sometimes it's a big testimony, like, man, I led a guy to the Lord or whatever. But we, you know, if faith will manifest itself in testimony, will manifest itself in tangible things. Following the law didn't do that. They couldn't do that. He's trying to tell these folks, you know, in just a little bit, that temple's not going to be there. You're going to need something else. And of course, we have something else dwelling inside of us. Listen to what he says <clears throat> about what faith is and how different areas. And, and each and every one of us could probably say, by faith I, and you could probably fill in a blank somewhere. But listen to what the apostle gives us. And he begins at the beginning. He says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things <clears throat> which do appear. Well, that's a biggie right there. What do you believe about this creation we live in? And, and I'm, I'm getting ready to do another uh, science falsely so called. I've been saying that for a while. Okay, I, about every two years I have a little presentation I give. We were, we were just talking, again, some of you might have, if you're, if you're familiar with, if you're on Facebook. There's this guy, who's a, he's a musician, and he's, he's a fairly, fairly popular musician. He won a Dove Award, and I guess a Grammy, or was nominated or something, you know. So he's like, you know. <clears throat> he came out and he said, he said, well, he says, we know, and he's supposed to be like a big Christian guy, right? Well, we know that, that science has proven that, you know, the, the, the account in Genesis can't be true. The six-day creation, God creating Adam. And then he said, well, because somebody asked him, well, Jesus said that, you know, Jesus said it was true. He said, well, he said, well, Jesus, maybe, maybe he didn't know. You know, like, he forgot. Like he was there, he was the word, and the word became flesh, and the word, you know, and by him all things were created. That's what the word says. But well, maybe he just like, it just kind of like blocked out of his memory. Or then he said this. I mean, that was bad enough. Then he said this. He says, maybe he lied. Now, now you know what? I, got, I have to really re refrain. I, I, have to, I have to, I'm thinking, why don't you go do something else for a living? Because, you know, we, we, we might have questions about, you know, the age of the earth and stuff. People can discuss that stuff. But if you, don't, if you don't believe what this says, and it says right here, faith, through faith, we understand. This is what faith is. This is why I have a hard time if people say, I'm a Christian, but, well, you know, yeah, we don't believe that first part. Listen, if the first part of Genesis is true, then the last chapter in Revelation isn't true. Because they're all tied in. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were made of nothing. Came out of nothing. Just by God's word. It wasn't, you know, you got these people that call themselves theistic evolutionists. Well, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, God used evolution. No, he didn't. If 
If evolution were true, then th this whole thing is worthless. Because by man came sin. By one man came sin. By one man came justification, righteousness, forgiveness. If, if, if there wasn't one man and one woman at the beginning of everything, it trashes everything from page one to page 2,000, or whatever you got in your body. It's, it's, people think that science has proven anything it hasn't. True science is not an enemy to faith. True, real science and faith go hand in hand. Albert Einstein said that, said that uh, science without religion is, is, is uh, lame, and religion without science is blind. He, he understood, and he was no Christian, and he wasn't even a Jew. I mean, he was a, nationally, he was a Jew, but he didn't, he didn't practice religion. But he, he believed there was something more than, something else had to be around for this stuff to just come into existence. We believe, I believe, I don't know, maybe you don't, I believe in the, the six days, just like it's written. Some of you might say, man, that's right, six days? They say the Big Bang happened in like a trillionth of a second. I always say, man, I, at least I give it a couple days, you know. They, 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 you know what, what they do is they, they, they come up with these theories because they cannot explain anything away unless they admit there's a supernatural. And because they don't want to admit that, everything has to have a natural cause and reaction. They come up with all these crazi theories about multi-universe, multiverses, and, and strings, and, and uh, just, you know, calculations on a blackboard. All these things, you know. You have these eggheads up there writing all this stuff down. It ends up with a big zero. By faith. I'm not afraid. I mean, I, I, you want to say, well, you know, you're superstitious. I don't care. I'm going to believe what the Bible says. I believe for 30 years I believed all that other stuff. Well, not quite 30 because when I was young I didn't believe anything. But, but <laughs> Through faith we understand. You, you need to just etch it in your brain. I don't care how, what the IQ is or how many degrees they got when they stand up and tell you you know, the, the Dawkins and the Carl Sagan's and all these other ones, Stephen Hawking, they try to tell you that, you know, science has proven, it hasn't proven anything. They can't go back 13 trillion years and see what happened. I heard a guy say, I'm not going to ramble on this about too much longer, but a guy was talking about, well, we know we can talk. He said, we can look out there and see stars that got planets. We're talking like, you know, millions, billions of light years away. And they can see and they say, well, we know there's a planet going around this, 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 this star out here. And but there's a pretty good chance they've got life on it. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, okay. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I believe in the six-day creation. I believe that God spoke everything into existence and created everything from nothing by the word of God, by his power. He didn't need any kind of natural action or reaction. His word spoke this time, space, matter, thing we're living in right now. He's spoken into existence. Now the author begins to list individuals who had faith and how their faith was manifested. The first one he talks about, and he's starting all the way back before the flood. By faith, Abel, Abel, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. We all know the story, chapter 4 of Genesis. There came a time for them to bring an offering. And, and you have to just kind of read, uh, not read between the lines, but understand that <clears throat> Adam and Eve started creating children. Cain and Abel were, I guess, the two oldest. 
they, they certainly had many others, you know, because these were young men and they were told to go and replenish the earth, so they probably had many children, but Cain and Abel were the oldest. Somehow, either through Adam or somehow, it was conveyed to them that it was necessary to bring, if they wanted to approach God, they had to bring a sacrifice. They had to bring a sacrifice. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing that God did was sacrifice an animal. Shed blood. Cover them with skin. So, whether God spoke to them directly, and he very well could have, because in that passage he did speak to Cain, or whether it was conveyed through their father, Adam, they knew that they had to bring, they were given that information. They didn't just wake up one morning and say, well, I think I'm going to bring a sacrifice. They brought a sacrifice. We know the story. Cain brought one of the firstlings of the flock. Shed blood. Brought it to the Lord. Cain brought the, you know, the peppers and the squash and the stuff that he grew. Probably good stuff. It says that Abel's offering was more excellent. It was a more excellent sacrifice. Why? Because he realized that he needed to bring a blood offering to cover his sin. He realized that he was a sinner, that he could not approach God on his own merits, that the only thing, the, uh, he said it here in the last couple chapters, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It goes all the way back to the garden, all the way back to Cain and Abel. Abel realized that without the shedding of blood. So he brought a more excellent sacrifice. He believed God. Cain, on the other hand, rejected what God had to say. He rejected God's word. He knew God. If, if the, same, the same God that spoke to Abel, I'm sure spoke to Cain. I'm sure Adam taught the both of them, told them what had happened and how things had happened. I'm sure he taught the both of them that. Why did Cain bring an unacceptable sacrifice? It wasn't that he didn't believe God existed, because he talked to him. And God even gave him a second chance. When, 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 when God refused his offering, it says Cain was upset, and God said, why are you upset? He said, if you do what's right, you can read about it. Abel brought a better sacrifice because he brought it in faith, believing that God would accept him based on the shed blood of an innocent animal. And that's the only way he can accept us. It's the only way he can accept us. It says that he obtained witness because of his obedience, because of his faith, believing God's word. He obtained witness that he was righteous. That was, that, that was in evidence to all around him. See, your faith will manifest itself to the place where people will look at them and say, hey, we can look back and say, Abel was righteous because he brought the, off, the offering. He obtained witness that he was right, righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, he still, he still testifies. The first murder, the first human sacrifice, still testifies that it's by the blood. That's from the very beginning. Look who the next guy is. We're probably not going to get through this chapter today. By faith, Enoch was what? Translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him or changed that word translated means changed him from one thing to another. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible. <laughs> Enoch had so much faith that God didn't let him die a natural death. Now, we don't know much about Enoch. You can read about him again in Genesis, I think, chapter 5. And I think I have that up, 
uh, Genesis chapter 5, when, when, when the, the author is going through the genealogies of the, the, the children of Adam, Jared lived 162 years, and uh, he begat Enoch. That's not Jared from Subway. Okay, it's a different Jared. Okay, and he begat sons and daughters. Go ahead, uh, verse 20. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Well, that's not very long for back then, but something happened. Go ahead. And Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Enoch was raptured. Why? Out of all those people, we know that in that time, the hearts of men were wicked above all things. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was Enoch's uh, grandson. But why? Why did he take Enoch? He walked with God. He believed God. He had faith. He might have been one of the last righteous people living on the earth of, of that time. Noah had not been born yet. God took him. It says elsewhere, over in Jude, he's mentioned here, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, in verse 14, prophesied of these, saying, Behold the Lord, he's talking about false teachers and false prophets, prophesied, saying, Behold the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch knew something about ungodly because he lived in an ungodly time. So what do we know about this Enoch? Not, not a whole lot. But we know that he believed God. And he was a righteous man. And he was willing. Obviously he testified. Obviously he was a prophet of his day. There is a book of Enoch out. And I would not recommend it. We're not sure where it comes from. But obviously he was quoted you know, by Jude. Enoch was a, a man of God in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. And he walked with God. He believed God. He believed what God said. He had faith. And he pleased God. And out of all that bunch, God translated him. Now, we're going to get to Noah in a minute, but I want to, I'm going to kind of put this perspective. We have Enoch and we have Noah. A lot of people will say, not a lot of people, but it's, it's like a, a thought that Enoch was a type of the church, raptured before judgment. Noah was a type of Israel, protected in the midst of judgment. Just something to think about. It was a picture, a type in a shadow is the, the apostle was saying in the rest of this letter. Everything in the Old Testament had a, had a purpose. All these things, you know, Melchizedek, all these, all these people in the Old Testament, the people he's talking about here, they have, a, they have a, a relationship with those in the New. I always tell people, stay on your topic, don't get off. All right. Okay. <laughs> but I just, I just had, a, you know, I was thinking about that. I just, all right. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, what was the? Right, why would you want to? Yeah. And why, why would God, you know, if, if somebody had been changed, you know, if he was a picture of the rapture, why is he going to come back and die again? You know, it's, it's like, so, uh, who are the, I don't know who the two, two prophets are. I don't know who they are. But anyway, okay. Back to, back to our topic. I'm sorry. I veered off, I veered off the path. Okay, but I just, I just that, was, that was eating at me. You know, I was reading that, and I'm thinking, okay, all right. <laughs> Verse 7. By faith, Okay. Let's read, let's read verse 6 again. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't please God. I don't care how, I don't, what you do. If you don't believe what God's word says, you can't please him. You can win Dove Awards and Grammy Awards and sell a million albums and talk about the love of God and everything else. But if you don't believe what God's word says, you're not pleasing to him. He stops his ears. Holds his nose. By, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe. It's not should believe. He that comes to God should try to. 
must believe what? That he is, that's a good start, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you think there's a payoff to all the things, all the toil that you've endured for the sake of Christ? He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We believe that there's a payoff. We don't get saved to get the payoff. We get saved because we believe in what he did and we're, we're lost sinners and our hearts wicked above all things and, and we trust God. But we got to believe, we got to grab a hold of this truth that he is a rewarder. He will reward. Uh, Cain, uh, I'm sorry, Abel, Enoch, Noah, all the rest in this group that we're going to read here tonight, next week. He is a rewarder. He will reward you. Maybe not in this life. That's not talking about earthly rewards because those things fade away anyhow. But there's a promise. These are the things that we hold on to, the, the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you believe that there is a reward for the people of God? We must believe. We must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligence. It's not an option. I'm sure every one of us at one time or another gets our faith shaken a little bit. I'm sure every once in a while we, we, you know, we, we kind of lose sight of things and we're human. But deep down inside there's that spirit of God saying, look, it's coming. It's coming. There, there's, there's, the good things are coming. It's coming. Don't, don't turn back. Don't draw back. You know, it's okay. Sometimes things get so overwhelming and oppressing and, and you, lose your, you lose your direction and you lose your, your traction. And it's, it's like uh, you're like spinning your wheels and you say, what, what in the world is going on? Lord, am I really saved? I'm, you ever say that? Lord, am I really, am I really born again? Oh, Lord, maybe I missed it. Maybe I, but, but you see, he's, God is always faithful. Okay. Maybe one more and then, and then we're going to. We'll close. <laughs> By faith, Noah. He's, a, he's another target. The idea of a worldwide flood and this judgment, this destruction. They don't like to talk about judgment. When you start talking about God's judgment, they get antsy. And, they, and, they'll, and I've, I've, I've watched these programs where geologists, you know, will look at, like, strata of stuff. And they'll point to one place and they'll say, boy, something really happened here. Maybe it was an ice age. Maybe it was a meteor or an asteroid that hit the earth. Maybe nobody says anything about a flood. You know. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. God says, Noah, rain's coming. They never saw rain. It was a big terrarium. The whole earth was surrounded by a shroud of water or ice. Filtering out the harmful rays of the sun. There was water above. There was water below in the ground. And there was the oceans. And the earth was like a big greenhouse. And it was a wonderful, you know, just a terrific climate. That's why people lived to be 900 years old. But God said, listen, there's rain coming. No, I never saw it. Didn't have any clue of what that was about. But he believed what God said. He was warned of God of things not as yet. He was moved with fear. And that's not the cowering, you know, hiding kind of fear. But he said, man, I better, get, I better be about what God says to do. When you try to warn people today, they laugh at you. People have tried to warn people in, in this nation, leadership of this nation. Our, our society has gone completely into like anarchy because when somebody does stand up and shout warnings they call them crazy or ridiculous or lunatic or whatever they laugh at them I want to be ready for, for God's judgment God's judgment's coming it's not going to be happy clapping I'm, I mean I'm before the rapture I'm looking forward to the rapture for the wrath of man you know wrath of God gets poured out but judgment is coming 
Noah said, you better be prepared. Again, elsewhere in the Word says he preached. For 120 years, he preached to that bunch back in. He didn't keep it all to himself. He said, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He, an ark? What are you building that for? We, we, we never saw an ark. A boat. God brought all the animals in that boat. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Again, we see faith, righteousness, salvation. The, the offer of protection and judgment was made to everybody. But nobody listened. Nobody wanted to forsake their sin. So they didn't listen. And they were killed in the flood. By his very actions, his faith, by his very actions, spoke condemnation, preached judgment to the world at that time. That's why when you have real faith, when you have faith, the, the action of faith in your life and the, and the results that it produces in the way you live, you will speak condemnation to the people around you. Not with your mouth. Some people try to do it with their mouth. You know, we'll say, oh, yeah, man, you're going to go to hell. But you don't have to say that. When people see the, your faith manifested in deliverance, in testimonies, in God moving in your life, in changes in your life, positive changes, when they see the faith of God manifested in your life, you will condemn them. That's why they try so hard to drag you back. When Noah was building this crazy ark, Weird. Sometimes God will tell you to do something that's weird. You don't know what I'm talking about. That makes sense. When the world saw that, him doing that, they probably mocked at him. Probably said, what are you doing? He'd preach to them and they wouldn't listen to him. But when the rain started falling, he was protected. He was covered. If you read about Noah's, God's command for Noah to build the ark, we're going to close with Noah tonight because it's good coming. He told Noah how to build the ark. He gave him the size and told him what to build it out of. Then he told him to take pitch and cover it. Pitch was like tar, like, you know, the bread, tar pits, you know. It was like tar. And he told him to cover, cover that whole big boat with this pitch. Do you know the word used for that, that word pitch is the same word used for atonement. It's a covering. Kefar. Kefar. Atonement. What a picture of salvation through faith. Noah believed God. He was obedient to build the ark. He was obedient to preach the word. And then when judgment came, he was covered. Our faith one of the things, that, the substance of what we hope for, the evidence of what we don't see, is that our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The atonement, the mercy seat, the covering. See, Paul's trying to let the people, the readers of this, he's trying to say, listen, all these Old Testament patriarchs that you put so much faith in, they don't put faith in them. Their faith was in God. And because they had faith, they did things. This was, this was all before any law was given. This was all before any Torah. This was before Moses. This is before, you know, Egypt, the Mount Sinai. This is all before that. It's even before Abraham. He's going to get to Abraham. We'll, we'll, get, we'll start with Abraham next week. All before that, they had faith. And it's the same today. Do we believe God? Did the and I could ask you this question. I believe I would know the answer because I know most of you. I know like all of you. Can you look back on your life 
of faith and can say, by faith I, by faith God, by faith I experience, by faith. See, that's, that, that's something that no other, no cult can give you that. No other religion can talk about the faith in something you can't see that is tangible. It's evidence. That's what faith is. We're going to find out as we read on further these. There were, there were saints in the Old Testament that suffered. Today in the world, there are saints, there are Christians who are suffering. They must have faith. Somebody must believe in God. Jesus said, when, when, I, when, I, when, the, when the Lord returns, will he find faith on the earth? He will. When that trump sounds, there's going to be a whole lot of people that got faith. Not perfect people. None of these ones we talked about so far were perfect. Well, maybe Enoch. We don't know much more about him. Maybe he was so perfect, maybe that's why he was translated. <laughs> But old Noah, he got drunk. You know, I mean, I mean, when we go through this list, the rest of these people, they all had their faults. But they had faith. There were times when their faith wavered. But they believed God that was counted to them for righteousness. So tonight, I hope and pray that you believe God. And I believe you all do. Because when the judgment comes and when, when our faith is shaken... It might be shaken, but it won't, it won't fall. Build your house upon a rock. Build your house upon a rock. And you'll stand, no matter how bad the storms blow. Amen. Anybody have any comments or questions tonight?